Hello and welcome to the last evening of this year's film sector at Art Basel. My name is Max Azola, I'm the curator. And the last evening is not reserved for my program, it's reserved for Marianne Masson's program, Burden. She will present the new documentary on Chris Burden. And I'm very happy that uh, this is her first year here at Art Basel. I'm very happy to have a, another female colleague. There's not so many. <laughs> <laughs> Marianne um, lives in New York and she has been uh, programming at the New York Film Festival for 30 years and she's worked there also in the last years as the associate programmer. Uh, uh, yes? Yeah, close enough. <laughs> and uh, she's also worked for the New Films New Directors Festival. So she's really coming from, you know, the, the world of film festivals. Um, she is now um, working on smaller festivals. She's involved with a new creative advertising agency called Jump Cut Creative, who also support experimental filmmakers. Really interesting direction, actually. And she's on the committee for the, of the uh, Princess Grace, as in Monaco, Foundation, who also support UK, young UK, um, New York film, US, sorry, US filmmakers. Um, so she's, you know, got a lot of different kinds of experiences and um, she will tell you in a minute why she chose this exciting film burden for us tonight. Um, just because it's the last evening, I would say, I'd like to say thank you to you, the audience, Thank you to my colleague Michael Müller, who is here, but as usual hiding from the spotlight. But Michael is really, I mean, without him, we wouldn't be here, neither, either of us. So thank you very much, Michael. Can we have an applause for Michael, actually? <laughs> thank you so much, Michael. <laughs> and I'm really looking forward to next year. But before that, here's Marianne Masson for you. Uh, thank you, Max. Uh, yes, and thank you, Mikhail. It's, it is all because of him. We're very happy to, to work with him. And I'm so happy to be here uh, to present Burden to You, um, a film. What we try to do in this program is to present a film uh, about a, a, uh, an artist. Um, you've been watching art all week long, all different kinds of art. And here is one story of one artist. A very powerful artist um, comes from what I'm going to now dub, maybe others have, the California school because they have a very particular way about them. Um, we don't have a lot of time, and we want to save it to have uh, questions afterwards so where we can talk much about it. But right now, I'd like to bring down the directors of the film, Tim Marinan and Rich Dewey. And uh, they're just going to say a couple of words, and then we'll have the film. So Richard and Timothy, please. Thank you very much, Marion. Um, and thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we're super excited to uh, have the European uh, premiere of Burden uh, here at Art Basel. Um, Chris actually spent some of his childhood here in Switzerland and did one of his iconic performances uh, at Art Basel uh, back in the early 70s. So it seems like the perfect place uh, to show the film um, in Europe. And we just want to thank uh, Marion and everyone at Art Basel for inviting us and programming it and all the help in coordinating uh, everything. And thank you guys for coming. And um, as you said, Tim and I will be around afterward for questions. Thank you. Tim and Rich, so you know who you're speaking to. Um, and unfortunately, we can't ask questions of Chris Burden, but we can ask questions of the two of you. Um, I'm going to start with a few questions, but then we have microphone here for uh, questions from all of you. Um, I usually start at the beginning, but I'm going to start at the end. Um, what did um, Chris Burden's death do to the film? Did it change your plans in any way? I presume you knew he was ill, but you have been working with him. Um, yeah, it was quite sudden, actually. It, it was towards the end of when we were making the film, um, and actually we were, we were filming with him at his studio in late 2014, and that was actually right at the time that he... Uh, found out from his doctors that um, his 
uh, cancer had spread and the prognosis didn't look good. And then he passed away, as you saw in the film, in um, May. So it, it all happened quite quickly towards the end uh, of his life. Um, and so, yeah, obviously completely unexpected. We, he was not sick when we started working with him a number of years before that. Um, so it did change things in terms of our time with him was cut, suddenly cut short and um, we, we did have sort of more filming planned to do with him uh, around that final piece, Ode to Santo Dumont, and some more filming with him at his studio. Um, so obviously, you know, completely unexpected and very sad thing. Um, and in terms of how you know, it changed things with the film. It cut our time with him a bit shorter than expected. It maybe made us a little bit more reliant on digging a little bit more for some of the early archival footage that you see, interviews with him from the 70s and 80s and 90s, um, which actually I think in some ways, in hindsight, was maybe um, quite a positive thing for the film because I think it's quite nice seeing him talk about those performance pieces while they're still quite present to him and talk about the transition from performance into sculpture while that was quite fresh in his mind and, and things rather than later in his life. Um, so yeah, that's sort of how it, how it changed things in terms of our plans with the film, I think. And did you do any more uh, interviews of anybody else after that or did you then just get to work to, to form the film? Uh, we did a couple interviews after Chris passed away, one with his um, very good friend Paul Schimmel and uh, another with his friend uh, Charles Hill. Um, but I think, you know, to add to what Tim said, we sort of went four years of making the film with one ending in our mind of how we would, how the story would end and then his passing just, okay, now you have a completely different third act and a completely different way to wrap up the story. So to do that, we we had to circle back and speak with a few other people. It's really interesting how it does that in, in nonfiction film and documentary. You never know what's going to happen as here, you're going to say. Yeah, no, I, well, I was just going to say to add to that, in terms of the people we spoke to, Chris, when he, as I think we sort of um, mentioned a little bit in the film, when he did get um, sick and he, it seemed like the prognosis was not good and that he might not have a lot of time left, he kept it very, very private. He literally only told his family, the people he worked with in his studio, the handful of people and a couple of friends. So it was completely unknown in the sort of wider art world because I think he really wanted to prior prioritize the limited time he had left with spending time with the people closest to him, obviously, and also his work. And I think, you know, he didn't want to necessarily be distracted by by that. So Paul Schimmel was one of those very close friends at the end of his life who knew him during that time. So, yeah, one of the people who we spoke to after he passed away. So you'd real, you didn't really have any more time with him then if he was really focusing on the work itself? Yeah, that's that's right. Once, once he became ill, we, we didn't shoot with him again or have any more time with Chris. And, and how long, and now it's sort of going back to the beginning, but how long did you um, work with him? Were you able to film him? Because you spent a lot of years sort of planning and making the film. I don't know how many of it he was, that you were, you were filming him and you were working with him. Yeah, it came about um, over quite a few years. We just sort of briefly, we, we initially interviewed Chris for a magazine article for White Wall Magazine, which was probably about seven years ago. Um, Rich and I met with him and interviewed Chris and wrote an article about him. And off the back of that, we made a short film with him about a piece called, um, following a, just one single piece he made, uh, Beam Drop, which he made in Antwerp, which is a follow-up to the Beam Drop that you see in, in the film that he did in the 80s. And then off the back of that, we approached him about doing this larger film covering his life and work more broadly. And I guess that was probably four and a half years ago, something like that. So we were kind of working with him consistently through that time. Obviously, at the beginning, it took a little while to sort of research and get off the ground. So we started more with delving into the, his personal archive of works and things. And, you know, the, the later period of that, the last year or so, um, was really just editing. We the, the last thing we filmed was Santos Dumont when that opened last May. Um, but that other time in between, it was a case of kind of Chris's works take shape over a very long period of time. So in order to kind of capture some of the making of those sculptures, we would sort of, you know, 
go back every few months and spend another sort of week at the studio catching up on what was going on or go to wherever, you know, something was in development. So kind of just incrementally checking in over that period of time and seeing kind of what was bubbling away and what was going to be the next piece to be finished. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of how we how we worked with him. Well, talk about this uh, a bit. Uh, right in the beginning, I think, when you're, you're, you're uh, interviewing him and he talks about he doesn't like he doesn't think all the time about, of, of course, his old work and the work that he did. But um, I wonder how he does approach those things now and how, and you working with him too, with the work that he's, you're filming the work that he's currently doing um, and the projects, and you go back month after month. But what is it like to try to get him to to think and talk about the older work? It's interesting, you know, I was thinking of, um, of Shoot, and, um, you know, I read somewhere, of course, it is about you know, the violence in America, but at one point, I think it was 71 was shoot, and also there was the Vietnam War going on. And I myself sit, and even just now in the United States, certainly there, there's just even more gun violence than there has ever been. And I wonder if he, if he would have looked at it that way. And I don't know if you ever talked to him about things like that, like how he views that work then now. Yeah, I think the early work, um, he would talk to us about it, um, but it was sort of over 45 years he had been asked those questions by so many people that um, you really wouldn't get the excitement or the enthusiasm out of him the same way you would if you were talking to him about the erector set skyscrapers or the lamps. For those things, he had just had a lot of enthusiasm and would tell you stories um, and go over all the details. Um, whereas if you ask him about shoot, he would answer it, but just sort of say, yes, I had a friend shoot me and can we please sort of move on? So yeah. I think relying on the film, we relied on some interviews that were done, um, not so long after shoot where he was a little more, um, uh, I guess, you know, he hadn't been asked those questions so much and they were a little fresh and I think he was a little more thoughtful in his responses and, and we didn't go into asking him that much later in life about the early works. And I think with the kind of, you were asking about the political context and how much he linked it to sort of Vietnam and there was like student protests and, and all that sort of stuff going on in America at the time. I think, you know, he personally in talking about it didn't really make very specific links to that. And I think when he talks about the piece, he talks about it. I mean, he definitely says that, I think he says it in the film, that being shot is as American as apple pie. So he acknowledges that it's something in the culture of America, that guns are very present, obviously. So, you know, clearly Vietnam and the things that were going on in society at that time and, and still are in different ways were in his mind. But I think he was also quite inwardly focused on it. Like he kind of approached those things similarly to how he approached uh, the later kind of more engineering or scientific works kind of in a scientific way with just having a thought in his mind or an idea that he wanted to investigate with his body and sort of just figuring out, okay, you know, being shot is this thing in society that's a big thing. I want to experience what that's like. How do you do it? You know, uh, where do you do it? And just sort of going through it in this very methodical way and just kind of seeing how it affected him. Um, but definitely, that I think, for us looking at it, those links are certainly there to what was going on in society at that time. And, and of course, what all art is, it's what they think, but it's also how we view it and what we take from it. And also all that early work, it is performance work. And so to, to think about it and talk about it later, it, it really is sort of done. And in some ways, the, the newer work when he was working on it is almost performative in a sense that it takes so long. And, and as you say, the, the technical aspects of it, and when he gets to certain points, they may be new performances for him. I don't know. Any more questions out there, or any questions out there? Feel free. No, 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 no. Okay, that's fine. Um, talk about um, some of the, well, it's very interesting. I'm thinking of um, urban, urban Lights, yeah. Urban Lights, which is this beautiful thing. And actually, before we started this evening, we were talking about tourism in Los Angeles and what they take from it. And here it's mentioned that this is something that tourists love um, in Los Angeles. And, uh, and so it brings a sort of a new aspect to the city to people, I guess. Um, but talk about, I don't know when that, that was in 2011. So you were, still, you were working with him as that was being put together. Am I correct? So we actually, 
we, we were around when that was being put up. We weren't actually filming with him at that time. So he continued actually making lamp sculptures on a smaller scale. So there's he's done a couple of other pieces. Um, one is at Brandeis University in the US. Uh, another one was exhibited in New York. So a lot of the lamps that you see being worked on are actually for subsequent pieces, but it's kind of the same process of he had this, he, he got the lamps from the same place and they would restore them in the same way. So... Um, yeah, we sort of came in at the tail end of, of that uh, urban light piece. And um, yeah, as you say, it has really become, I think probably more than any other piece, it's maybe the one that if he was known as the guy who was shot for his art, it's probably the one that kind of got him known for something else. And I think there's a whole generation of people, p particularly in Los Angeles or people who visit Los Angeles who know that piece or know him connected with that and may not even know about the performance works. And it really has kind of become a bit of an L.A. landmark because L.A. didn't really have a lot of public artworks that it was known for. It had sort of architecture or things that were somewhat iconic. But, um, yeah, you, you land there at LAX and there's a picture of it as you're getting out of the terminal. It says, welcome to Los Angeles, and there's a picture of the lamps. So it's really become a, a kind of a big thing there. And another thing is this, and it's also mentioned in the film, how he sort of became this like cuddly little thing when he was this sort of crazy performance artist uh, when he was younger. But it's it's interesting because as I look at it and I and I, I see him um, being interviewed, and here's another thing that I find very interesting about this. One of the first um, television interviews he does, and <clears throat> excuse me, um, after he did shoot, and the guy in the bow tie who's interviewing him, his name is Regis Philbin, and he was very well known in the United States. He had this like very, very, very mainstream uh, talk show, and this was probably when he was in Los Angeles and was in New York. So I find that's incredibly interesting at that time, certainly in the early 70s, very, very, very mainstream television in the U.S. would actually look at these kinds of artists. His, of course, was because it was news, because he had shot himself, but it reminds me of many other artists, too. Or in mainstream television, so so everyday Americans could, saw, could listen to these people and listen to their work. So I found that incredibly interesting. Um, but I also found myself in looking at it, people talk about how he changed so much. Maybe his work evolved, and he certainly evolved, but... You, he still, to me, seems sort of the same person um, in terms of how he approached his work, certainly. Would you find that from the things in the archives that you looked at and then in working with him later, would you find that same thing? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think there were a lot of um, elements of Chris's work that, um, as you say, you w they wouldn't be obvious that this guy who did shoot also did Urban Light, but there were um, things like, as Tim said, that... that um, desire to experiment and that desire to, um, to, uh, fulfill his curiosity and, and sort of see how far he could push certain limits. Um, I think with a lot of the sculptures like M Metropolis too, um, it was very difficult. Uh, I think it was nine months installing that piece. And so a lot of people said, uh, he really pushed museums as far as they could go. Um, and, and the same with the new museum as well. I, that was, I think a year to get all the logistics there. So yeah, there were a lot of, um, common elements that came out in Chris's life and work, um, throughout. I think it just, it, they manifested themselves in different ways, but, um, uh, there were a lot of through lines that were. Yeah. And I think that jo Jonathan Gold, who was his assistant, um, uh, for a while kind of used those later works as cuddly. And I think maybe he finds them a little less interesting than the performance works, but obviously they have a different kind of mass appeal and people of all ages and things like that it appeals to. But I think Chris definitely retained a bit of an edge. Like he was driven and as Rich was saying, he wouldn't sort of compromise anything. He was difficult to work with for like museums and institutions and things like that because he was so kind of single-minded with how he wanted the artwork to be presented and, and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, the work is different, but he, he had the same drive and intensity, I think, just directed in a slightly different way. And, and I don't know that he was he was looking to do work that would appeal to people. He was just looking at, at things he wanted to investigate, perhaps. Yeah, I, th I think that's accurate. Yeah, it was just investigating different things. Um, but he was every bit as careful and methodical and meticulous in planning something like shoot as he was in, as you see with the lights of getting every single tiny door and, and screw in the lamps exactly right. And everything sandblasted perfectly. And, um, 
and the images for all all of the um all of the performances a lot of the people that were there told us in conversations that Chris was very methodical in, in how the work was to be photographed and presented later. And so, uh, yeah, j just a, a lot of different things that were similar throughout his career. And, and that's something too with the, the performance work also is that film was part of it from the beginning, film or video, because everything was documented and was filmed so that that's how you actually saw it. Except for when he disappeared for five days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just. Uh, oh, here we have somebody. We don't want to miss anybody. But I do want to get back to the disappearance. Hi, I, I have a question about um, which works that you um, decided to cover. Was part of it based on availability of archival resources or were you mostly selecting which of the earlier works to cover based on, you know, kind of the narrative structure that you were presenting in the documentary? Or I guess, yeah, or maybe you could speak a little bit more about your ability to find the resources that you were looking for in general, which can be a really tough task with some of these uh, performance works. Um, yeah, I think for the performance, some of it was guided by archival and what was available, although for almost everything, we had at least a couple of photographs to work with. But I think the more important thing was we tried to select a performance that highlighted a certain um, aspect of Chris's work. So for instance, um, Doom, there was this duration aspect to it of, or endurance, if you will, of he's just there for um, uh, three days. And it's a question of um, how long he's going to be there and what you should do as the viewer. Should you, as a good Samaritan, intervene or should you, as someone in a museum, not touch the art? And so that was a question that that piece posed that we wanted to explore. Something like shoot was very dangerous and, and provocative. Um, so I think each of the performances, as we look through the catalog, we tried to, tried to find ones that weren't um, exploring the same theme, but were um, looking at looking at a different aspect, but that also fit within his narrative arc. I think part of that arc was um, he started pushing outward. Um, so with pieces like um, uh, TV Hijack, he was involving someone else in that. And so that was a, a different um, than the prior performances where it was just him doing the performance. So there was a little bit of an arc to it in that way as well. Um, and crossing the line, I think a lot of people thought with with TV hijack. Are you going to add something? Um, uh, you don't uh, have to. Uh, I just Well, I was just going to say, but there was a lot of instances where, like he was, just linking to what you were saying about the documentation of his work, he was, um, it was all documented, not all of it was, but a lot of it was, it was done very specifically, but not very comprehensively. So there was sometimes maybe just a couple of images and that was sort of his choice that he liked. That was Those are the two images of the piece that are going to be out there. So it was definitely a bit of a challenge to sort of how do you show performance when that's all you have really that remains of it. So we worked quite hard to find people who were actually there at the performances to hopefully be able to quite vividly sort of retell the experience of being there, what that was like, or were involved in the performances, like the lady who had the knife to her throat, the guy who pulled the gun, the man who put the water down to end that doomed piece, and then worked with our um, graphics person, Scott Grossman, to try and build out a little bit around those pictures. So we drew on a lot of Chris's sketches or diagrams or things like that to try and show a little bit of, you know, how his mind was working and the planning of those pieces and things to, you know, make make those bits of archival material that were available stretch a bit further and and be sort of interesting to look at. Um, just to follow up on that, if I may, what prompted my question was um, I saw that you showed just one image of the piece that he did at um, Oberlin College where I'm a curator um, movie on the way down where he, you know, went into the student gym and had himself kind of strapped up with the movie camera and he was filming himself as he fell, you know, the rope was cut and it so I, I guess something happened with the movie camera though. So there was no footage of that actual fall, if I'm remembering correctly. So the one image that you showed, I think is literally the only um, document of that performance and it was just taken by the curator at the time. Um, so, uh, you know, it's interesting that that's the only, you know, one thing that exists of, the, of the, that one particular piece, but others were of course more extensively um, documented. 
And we managed to find some stuff that wasn't in his archives and that hasn't been seen anywhere before, like the the doomed piece. They, he didn't have the recording of that, but the museum actually had the film that they shot of that that we sort of got digitized for the first time. I don't think they'd ever shown it anywhere or anything. So, um, yeah, we managed to unearth a few new things and a bit of additional material that even Chris and the studio weren't aware of. But, um, yeah, sometimes it is quite limited what remains. Thank you. Yeah, that, that would be interesting to, to, to yes to know that he did document so many things, but other things where yes, it was just by happenstance that there was this one you know one person shooting something there. And so, speaking of um, of the work that you you did in creating this film, um, as two filmmakers, how do you, what's the division of labor? How do you decide who does what? Or do you simply plow into everything together? Uh, you did I, it for I, a long time. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of it at the beginning was um, when we interviewed people, um, it would be Tim and I and and maybe one other person, but one of us would be behind the camera, one of us would be asking questions, and then sometimes uh, halfway through the interview we would switch and the other person would ask questions and, and the other person would be behind the camera. Um, and... Uh, and then as it, as it progressed and we got to the point of actually putting the story together, um, I think Tim and I were so close to the material and had been close to Chris for five or six years that it was really uh, our editors really helped shape the story um, and highlight things for us that would be interesting um, to an audience that was coming uh, to Chris fresh. So I guess to, to answer your question, um, as far as working together, we did split things, um, uh, pretty equally in, in doing the interviews and filming with Chris at the studio and filming some of the, um, uh, the sculptures like urban light and metropolis too. And then, uh, when it came time to shaping it, uh, as Tim said, we had a great graphics person and editors and it really felt like a team effort in the last year. Very quiet crowd here tonight. They're all very pleased. They really wanted to ask Chris questions. I love the I love the end of this, by the way. It's just it's just sort of quite quite wonderful. I want to go back to some things, and maybe it's just talking about um, you know the ideas of this kind of work. Um, the the piece where he goes away for five days. Obviously, there's no documentation of that because he was he disappeared, but no one knew it. Um, and it, it reminded me, in a, in a sense, um, of, of kind of like, you know, the art and like whatever it is in what you do, or maybe in his case, what he didn't do and wasn't being there. Um, and there's a film, I actually think they're going to show it here. It's on their calendar, I think, um, Four Seasons in, Can in Cancy, about uh, Jean Berger, who's a critic and artist and a philosopher, and his idea of everything that you do, you know, then can be art. So his just going away in that sense, was art. And and how many, I mean, you have that one, who is it, Sewell, is that his name, the, the British critic? who Brian Sewell. Brian Sewell, who would certainly have none of it. Um, and uh, I presume he was that way for, I don't know if he's still with us, but, uh, you know, for most of his career. Or do, some, do people like that, for instance, and you're, as you find and as you're looking through this work, do they, do they get on board at some point? I mean, this is the kind of work that he has done, certainly the early work, it is, as you say, it's the kind of work that some people are like, you know, what the hell is this? But as time can go on, one sees what it means and it, it then makes sense to you. Um, did you notice in your research and stuff that a lot of people would come on board later? Yeah, I think that, I, I mean, we wanted to have Brian Sewell's opinions in there because he obviously represents quite a sort of conservative art critic view of the this it just isn't even art, like performance art shouldn't be considered art, it doesn't fall within the remit of art. And um, I think that does change over time because when like... Did he, when did he talk about these things? When did yeah. Brian Sewell? Yeah, and what years was, was this? When we filmed with him? Yeah. Uh, that was probably three years ago. Okay. He has actually passed away since then, sadly. He died last year, but... Um, it's not like he was saying this, like, you know, 20 years ago. No, he had written about Chris in the past, and we kind of knew his opinions on Chris, and we wanted to represent that opinion because that was definitely a reaction to Chris at the time when he first started making performance art, there were definitely a lot of critics coming from that point of view that didn't even consider it art. And I think over time, you know, when something makes it into the art history books, it's kind of like, 
you know, it's almost sort of like pre-approved or you're just looking at it in a different way where it's kind of like it was a movement in art that was influential. And But, you know, he, he I think we wanted to represent that... Um, that view of it and he also expresses it in such a kind of entertaining way <laughs> he expresses himself he doesn't pull any punches um so uh so yeah I, th I think there is that difference that in retrospect when you're looking back now it's easy to kind of like view it in the context of the time and as a movement that you know whether you kind of liked it or not um you know was something that uh has been significant but there was definitely a reaction when it first came out of from people of just like what is this this isn't you know this is totally kind of not legitimate <laughs> art or shouldn't be considered art so um so yeah i think it does um have that sort of different perspective as time goes on it does become sort of the comic relief i i think we have to go but if one more person has a question i certainly don't want to deprive you but i think everyone is satisfied um, well, I'm not, but we can discuss more later. Um, thank you very much. This is, uh, um, it's just, it's, it's a beautiful film and, uh, and I really got to know him and his work more than I ever did before. So thank you very much for this film to both of you. Thank you everyone for coming. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us.